Okay, so this is where we start. I'm going to start by sharing my screen. And we should already be started, have done that. That should have already been done. Okay, so I'm greeting people and I'll be like, oh, yeah, I'm glad you're here. That's great. That's wonderful. I'm going to be like, okay, welcome everybody. I appreciate you guys coming today and spending some time with me. Um, honestly, whether there was nobody here, I would still be doing this, um, but I'm glad you're here. So it makes it not so lonely for me. Uh, my name's Patrick. I am an MSW student at uh, Baylor University. And today we're gonna be talking about incorporating trauma-informed care um, with substance use disorders. Before we, begin, before we begin, I do wanna tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I've been married for 20 something years, um, like 28, I think, oh my God. Um, I've got two daughters who are grown. I've got uh, three dogs, uh, a cat, and a grand kitty. Um, like I said, I'm a Baylor MSW candidate. I'm also the volunteer coordinator for Operation Stand Down Central Texas, and that's a veterans homeless outreach center. Um, we also provide resources for all homeless population in the uh, Fort Hood, Colleen area. Um, I'm interning at Christian Farms Treehouse, which is a residential substance use um, disorder treatment center. Um, and I work for Central Texas Youth Services, um, their option house, which is a youth shelter where we house uh, runaway homeless youth as well as uh, um, youngsters who've uh, been displaced and are in the, the child welfare system. Um, I got here um, after spending 21 years in the infantry. Um, I received my BSW. I earned my BSW at a Texas A&M University, Central Texas in Colleen. Um, there I was a success coach for a while and I, I worked with a lot of students who, uh, um, who were having issues with their GPA and their academic performance. And I also became a member of the Phi Alpha Honor Society. And, and that was like a real big thing for me. Um, but that, that's enough about me. I mean, I do have um, you know, about 35, 40 minutes that I need to take up here. We can talk about me for this next 35, 40 minutes. Or we can talk about the, the trauma-informed care. And it's, and it's up to you guys, because I want this to be a discussion. So what do y'all want to hear about? OK, trauma-informed care wins. Um, good. Um, well, before we actually start and get into the meat of all this, I want to share a quote with you. And uh, um, that quote is, spend some time getting to know her, not her symptoms, find out about her life. And uh, I read that in. Uh, boy who was raised as a dog from uh, Dr. Perry. And this quote came from one of his first um, clinical supervisors. And, and there's no doubt in my mind that, that many of us use this approach and we employ this approach you know, daily with our, with our, uh, um, with our clients, um, but it's especially significant in the discussion that we're gonna have here today. And in that discussion, we're gonna talk about first some learning objectives, risk factors and attributes of uh, addiction, I'm going to introduce you to a client of mine, um, and then we're going to talk about trauma, definitions, causes, uh, the co-occurrence with, uh, with SUDS, which I will refer to substance use disorder at times. I'll refer to it as SUDS because it's easier for me to say. Um, and then we're going to talk about trauma-informed care and trauma-informed approaches, which I'm going to use those terms kind of interchangeably because uh, um, that's what we're focusing on is the approach. We're not really going to be focusing on interventions and trauma-specific care but just the, the approach and uh, um, kind of the culture that you can instill in, in your practice and in your organization and what trauma-informed care really is. Um, we'll talk about the theory and framework that, uh, um, that, that drives trauma-informed care, um, talk about implementation and possible barriers in, in implementing it into your organization. Um, some of the objectives, things I want you to walk away with here today is, is an understanding of the definition of trauma. Um, it's something I, I really, I didn't give it a, a lot of thought until I started doing research into this. Um, I want you all to consider the, I want you to be able to, to consider the effects of trauma to SUDS and SUDS to trauma and recognize the relevancy in their co-occurrence. Um, also to understand the theoretical framework of trauma-informed care and, uh, and how it would benefit your client system in your organization by implementing, implementing it and practicing it in your organization. Um, and then I want you to have an overview of, 
of how to implement it and, and how to take that leadership role, regardless of where what your position is in the chain of command of your organization. I mean, as social workers, we can be leaders, at, and as you know, in, in, at any level. Um, but there's some information that we're going to go over that can help you to, to, I don't know, assess the level of trauma-informed care that y'all are actually applying in your organization. So let's start with the theoretical risk factors and attributes of, uh, of addiction. I mean, it, there's no true like theory of addiction where somebody says, hey, this is why. Um, but there's a lot of factors and there's many theories that propose different connections um, between like addiction and our biology, our environments, and how we develop and the behaviors that we develop. And the first thing I want to mention or talk about is some of the biological um, individual risk factors. You know, I, it's pretty common knowledge. Well, I shouldn't say that, but I believe it is pretty common knowledge that there is a genetic disposition to addiction. Um, also, early drug use, um, like adolescent experimentation with certain um, substances, it can affect the brain development and sus susceptibility to addiction. Um, there's been some brain imaging studies done from people who are addicted to drugs or alcohol. And uh, um, these scans reflect physical, physical changes um, in areas of the brain that are crucial to decision-making, um, to judgment, to learning, memory, and behavior control. Um, these physiological changes can increase one's, um, one's risk to addiction. Um, and then mental health disorders. Uh, there, there's theories that schizophrenia, some psychotic disorders, uh, major depression, bipolar disorders, um, panic disorders, and even obsessive compulsive disorders are biologically based mental disorders. And some of these disorders can be a catalyst to substance misuse. Um, from there, let's look at the environmental um, risk factors. You know, at a relationship level, kind of at the lowest level of interaction in your environment, you know, we can consider, you know, parents who use drug or alcohol being raised in an environment where that's an acceptable behavior. Um, parents who suffer from mental illness, um, their child abuse, neglect, or even lack of parental supervision. Um, you know, these factors can lead to the introduction of substance uses, substances in one's environment and their behavior. Um, then we move to community, community level risk factors, you know, and these can be influences like, uh, um, I mean, violence in the neighborhood, um, gang related, uh, well, I guess that would go to peer, peer relations in the neighborhood if you're, you're hanging out with peers who use substances. Um, and then as at a, at a societal level, you know, some of the risk factors involved there would be once, um, you know, if, if an individual is suffering from stigmas, um, from racism, sexism, or oppression. Um, and then moving into like your behavioral development attributes, um, negative reinforcement, you know, and that's referred to pretty much like pain avoidance. And th the basic premise behind that is the substance use reduces the withdrawal dysphoria. I mean, basically, you know, um, when a person's addicted to drug, you know, the drug's pleasurable effect um, will decrease with time. And eventually they're experiencing, an individual's experiencing um, the, the withdrawal or the, the negative, the down, basically. Um, and then that negative effects, and once they take take over, the person's more likely to go back to taking the drug to avoid that withdrawal. And then the longer the person uses the drugs, you know, they build a tolerance to it and uh, the more negative effects there are. So it kind of works like a roller coaster going up and down and, and the highs and lows get bigger. Um, and then we look at, uh, um, what's the next one? Positive reinforcement. And that's pleasure seeking. And that's pretty much uh, in the, the classical learning theory to where, um, and quite simply, the theory states that from this approach, users will say they take drugs because they enjoy using them. They like the high, they, they enjoy it. And as long as they are not conscious of the negative effects, you know, they'll continue to seek joy from substance misuse. Um, there's incentive salience, which is cravings. 
and that links um, stimulus to particular brain systems um, to motivation, you know, which produces the drug craving. And then stimulus response learning, which is um, pretty much building habits. And uh, this goes back also into classical learning theory where there's a stimuli and responses are associated with outcomes. Um, and of course the outcomes is that pleasure from the high. And this determines the likelihood that a person will follow, um, follow from that stimulus to the outcome in the future, which is drug use. Um, and this model predicts that users will describe their use as being habitual or compulsive. And those are some of the theoretical risk factors um, to, to SUDS. This is the, the population that are at high risk to becoming, to, to suffering from a substance use disorder. And um, that's youth, people living in a low income area, military first responders, you have your minorities, and then uh, generational victims. And that would be like some of your uh, um, people who experience, you know, either mental health issues that are passed on biologically or that cycle of violence through family. Um, and of course, elderly, disabled, LGBTQ and mental health diagnosis. And if you look from the right to the left and left to the right of the screen, I mean, you, you could draw lines to where, um, you know, where some of this is prevalent, like mental health to mental health. Um, society, when we talk about oppression or stigmas or racism, um, you know, we've got all these minorities in here as well. Um, so moving on, I want to introduce you to Lacey. This is our referral that we have, and um, all the information we have from the referral is Lacey is a female. Um, she's a high school graduate. She has two kids that are nine and four years old, and right now they're in CPS care. She's 25 years old. And her primary jug of choice is methamphetamines, which is, she takes intravenously. Um, and looking at this, uh, you know, what we can see about Lacey right here in assessing an approach with, with this preliminary information, what would be, a, what would be a, um, an intervention that you would consider? I mean, what would be some of our primary um, evidence-based interventions that we use with substance use disorder? What, what about you, Amy? Um, what do you think we'd use? But what? CBT? Okay, that's a good one. Um, yeah, and uh, and here's some of the primary uh, um, interventions that we 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 consider when when discussing or thinking about you know um, substance use disorder, and that's cognitive behavior therapies, motivational interviewing, um, of course, pharmaco therapies and uh, dialectic behavior therapies. Um, again, and then there's the, uh, um, the social model, the 12-step social model and, and spirituality, which is, is really huge in, uh, in my practice, what I've seen through my internship at Christian Farms Treehouse, not just because it is Christian Farms Treehouse, but, uh, um, you know, I experience, I see these, these, I see my clients growing spiritually as they're going working through the 12 steps along with other interventions like motivational interview or DBT. Um, and it's pretty amazing to see how, how a lot of these um, youngsters is what I refer to them as sometimes, but how, how a lot of these clients, um, you know, they draw strength and motivation from the, this spiritual aspect of, uh, of uh, NA and AA. And for a lot of them, it's something that they're finally getting to explore and understand. And it's, it's really powerful to see. Um, but with that said, you know, um, I want to shift focus for a minute. I mean, I do want you to keep Lacey in mind because we will come back to her. But right now, I want to talk about trauma and, and definitions of trauma. Um, I, exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence. Does that look familiar to anybody? Can y'all shake your heads like, yeah, all right. Um, yeah, this is, this is um, what, how the DSM refers to trauma um, in the uh, criterion A of PTSD. Um, it's pretty simple, black and white, exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury or sexual violence. There's not a lot of wiggle room in there when it comes to what they're calling um, a, a traumatic experience. Um, but in my research, I found a lot of other um, references and uh, definitions, for lack of a better term, for trauma. And one 
is exposure to an extraordinary experience that presents a physical or psychological threat to oneself or others. And this generates a reaction of helplessness and fear. Um, that expands a little bit more upon what the DSM uh, proposes. Um, this one here, identified, uh, correction, an identified event or series of events that is experienced. Um, it has a physical or emotionally harmful, threatening, or overwhelming. Um, and its effect is, is, it's a lasting and holistic effect on functioning. Um, so the, these two kind of correspond with each other a little bit. And, uh, um, and you can see they're talking about the outcome as well, where we're talking about helplessness and we're talking about a lasting effect on functioning. Um, this neurologically based definition, I love this one because it, it is, to me, it's outside the realm of what these other definitions are because it's referring to, you know, our schemas and how our brain works. Um, and well, I'll read it. It produces an excess, um, the traumatic event produces an excess of external stimuli and corresponding excess of excitation in the brain. The brain is not able to fully assimilate or process that event. Um, and if y'all have ever studied EMDR, you know, this is, this, this is like, this, this, this just corresponds so well with uh, um, theories behind how EMDR works. Um, and, it, and it's outside the mold of what these other definitions are. And actually my favorite one is this one from us, from SAMHSA, which is a great resource for a lot of, of, of substance use and trauma um, information. Um, and that definition is an event, series of, of events or a set of circumstance that is experienced. It's physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening. It has a lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. Um, so what can you guys, if you would, participate with me here? What, what, what can you take away as a commonality um, between these, most of these definitions? Okay, that's good. What else? What about you, Katie? Okay. Um, yeah. And and so and, and looking at all these, um, and they talk about the events. I mean, if both me and you were exposed to the same extraordinary experience, would both me and you have the same lasting adverse effect on our functioning? either mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being? Would we, would we have the same effects? You can shake your heads on this one. No, no, we wouldn't. Um, you know, these effects of trauma and what an actual traumatic experience is, is it varies from person to person. So with that said, could we agree that trauma and its effects are subjective? Yes. Okay, great. Um, because I believe it is, and that, that's, that's what, I, don't know, I have a little bit of issue with how the DSM refers to the traumatic events, but I'm just an MSW student, but I do, I do like, um, love what I've discovered through, through the research here. Um, as we move on, let's talk about some of the causes of trauma. What are some of these events that we talk about when we say a traumatic event? Uh, first off, does anybody want to want to give me some ideas of what a naturally caused traumatic event would be, something from nature. Just unmute yourself and say something like lightning, lightning, forest fire, tornado. Okay, yeah, those are good. Those are all catastrophic natural events um, and they, they can cause trauma in individuals as we've seen with things like Katrina. Um, and then there's human caused trauma. And some of these are accidental events. What would be an accidental events that could cause trauma? Car accidents, plane crashes, structural collapses, like the bridge that fell down a couple years ago. I mean, this stuff's terrible, but it happens. And we hear about it, we hear about it a lot because of the way media works nowadays. Um, and last, what would be man, human caused trauma that is intentional, intentional acts. 
would be some of those. Yeah, and everything from terrorism to war to bullying. Um, and then of course we can identify that high risk population as well, like we did previously. And that's the high risk population for trauma exposure. Um, that look familiar? That looks very familiar. Um, and uh, in in these, when we look at this list here, what what which would you consider to be the most frequent cause of trauma? Which one would this population be exposed to more? Nature, accidents, or intentional acts? Yeah, unfortunately, intentional acts. Um, so. If you recall, this list should have jogged your memory, thinking back to the um, SUDS theoretical risk factors and attributes. Um, and what I want to do now is kind of compare, you know, thinking about trauma. Now let's think about the biological risk factors and look at this youth, this list. There we go. Look at this list of, 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 of our high risk population for being exposed to trauma. Um, early drug use that can affect brain development. Who on this list do you think might get involved in that early drug use? Youth, yeah. Military, because they join at a young age. Exactly. Um, then we have these environmental risk factors. You know, So the high risk population for trauma, who would be exposed to these environmental risk factors? Okay, yeah. I mean, if you said the whole list, you're, you're probably right, because I can see every person, every population in this list to fall under one aspect of these environmental risk factors. And the third being developmental risk factors, you know, your negative reinforcement, talking about pain avoidance and then habits. And those two kind of feed off each other because you start with pain avoidance and then you move into it being a habit. Um, you know, I could see where, again, I mean, who on this list would would fall into that category? Yeah, almost all of them. Y'all are brilliant. Um, so to me, the association is evident. I mean, would anybody disagree that ex that traumatic experience do not lend to high risk exposure to the uh, to the addiction theories that we've discussed here? I didn't think so. Um, moving on. So beyond just the risk factors. You know, that we've talked about, the etiology of SUDS could be PTSD and or the etiology of PTSD could be, correction, yeah, could be a substance use disorder. Um, so, and, and look at these statistics here. I mean, PTSD, somebody who suffers from PTSD is one and a half to four and a half times more likely to have a substance use disorder. Um, Folks with SUDS are between two and a half to almost 11 times more likely to have suffered from PTSD. Why is that? Does anybody have any ideas about that? Okay, well, I'm going to throw one out there to you. Um, and you tell me if you think I'm right or wrong. So, I mean, the PTSD, we already talked about the pain avoidance and pleasure seeking and habits and cravings. Um, but with the, the SUDS leading to PTSD, you know, when we, when we try to attain drugs, especially with Lacey, thinking about Lacey, she's an IV meth user. Do you think she started with meth intravenously? She was exposed to other drugs, I'm sure. And she probably put herself in a lot of dangerous situations to find the drugs, buy the drugs, and use the drugs as she built up to IV meth using. All of these situations, to include getting money for drugs, um, could put herself you know, in, in harm's way, in a high risk, expose herself to a traumatic event. Um, and that's why these numbers from SUDS to PTSD go from up to almost 11, 11 times more likely. A um, couple other and a couple other examples of people suffering from uh, or being exposed to trauma and almost 90% of adults, and this was out of 3,000 um, adults that were surveyed, um, were exposed to one or more of the criterion A 
trauma from the definition earlier. Up to 90% of women in such treatment may have experienced physical or sexual abuse, according to another study. Um, but I do want to shift your focus over to the right of the screen and look at this as a very unscientific survey that I did. Um, but this is my client population. Back in January, I administered the ACEs, the um, Adverse Childhood Ex Exposure um, Survey or questionnaire to my to my clients. And out of 22 of them, 19 of them scored four or above. And then in April with a totally different group of, of clients, they were all female clients. Um, out of 18 of them, 15 scored a four or above on the ACEs. And if you're not real sure about the ACEs, if you look at your handout, there's some information on the ACEs there, on the ACEs and, uh, um, and some sources where you can actually download it and, and use it in your own practice. Um, but in regards to treatment, you know, discerning which order, which disorder being SUDS or PTSD or trauma, a, a trauma related um, disorder, which would be classified as primary and which is secondary. I mean, that concept is non-existent. Um, and literature suggests that one disorder triggers or magnifies the symptoms of the other. And that's exactly what I just kind of went into there talking about PTSD and SUDS and SUDS and PTSD. Um, now, taking all that into account, let's let's consider Lacey again with a little bit more information. You know, we've we've uh, after meeting Lacey, we've discovered and and doing some assessments, we've discovered that Lacey scored a four on ACEs. She comes from a lower economic urban background environment. Um, she's Hispanic. And those are the new things, female. To, okay, so with this being Lacey, that kind of broadens, um, broadens what we know about her. So what would we consider now for Lacey, for her treatment? Would, would we change our methodology? Would CBT still work? Would uh, uh, DBT possibly still work? Would of course, the 12 steps and in, in, in spiritual interventions, adding that. I mean, all of that stuff is still effective with her. But maybe, you know, we don't have to change our methodology, but we can change our approach and the environment by applying an understanding of the neurological, biological, psychological, and social effects of trauma and the prevalence of these experiences in Lacey's lifetime. Um, and considering that, you know, we'd understand that trauma is is prevalent in her life, that she has been exposed to it, whether she consciously reflects it and admits to it. You know, there may be some issues underlying there at, that we need to be aware of. And that's where the trauma informed approach comes from and why it's 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 crucial to many practices to, um, you know, to help our clients. So let's discuss the TIC. Um, the framework, the thinking and understanding um, that kind of drives trauma-informed care. And we want to consider, while in, in enhancing substance abuse recovery through knowledge of trauma, and uh, we need to understand trauma's impact in interpersonal dynamics and incorporate this through all aspects of service delivery. Um, viewing the problem in context of trauma. You know, and, and that's where we view the presenting problem in the context of the client's experience. Um, when we respond to clients, we need to respond in ways that convey respect and compassion. That's dignity and worth of that person. Um, and we need to honor their self-determination by enabling um, them to rebuild interpersonal skills and coping strategies. Um, and doing this, we are promoting social justice. You know, we're strength, we're, we're promoting strengthening and promoting self-advocacy for the oppressed and, and vulnerable population that I had that list up before of the, um, the high-risk population. You know, we'll, we emphasize client strengths instead of focusing on pathology. And we, we work on building healthy skills rather than simply addressing the symptoms. Um, and then we reflect the needs to connect with others, be, um, to, to others to be respected and to become more hopeful in regarding their own recovery. You know, and this is part of the importance of human relationships. 
I mean, this frame supports a lot of aspects of our um, social work code of ethics. Um, I mean, and, and we've, we shift from this framework into some of the theories that um, that inform this approach. You know, one of the most prevalent one that I found was the feminist feminist theory, and um, the feminist consciousness of the feminist theory is the awareness that one's own suffering does not come from individual deficits, but it comes from ways in which one has been systemically invalidated, excluded, or silenced through social oppression. Um, the feminist theory recognizes how social and political framework can kind of distort the meanings given to um, individual experiences, and, and that includes experiences of trauma. And this kind of reflects um, almost victim blaming as well as stigma from society. Um, you know, the social context in response to the person who's been traumatized, it, it can be um, either stigmatized or negligible. And again, that's almost going into victim blaming. Um, another aspect is, is the postmodern feminist framework. You know, the social conditions um, that traumatize you know, the working class, so women, people of color, you know, that list that I had up on the screen earlier. Um, these folks are exposed to traumatizing events that could occur on a daily basis. Again, it's from that high risk population. Um, we also consider the socio political intersectionality, and, uh, um, and basically what they're referring to in this is that. You know, there's not a one size fits all approach and that we must recognize diversity um, of experiences that are shaped by our race, gender and class. You know, trauma informed care also references um, cognitive theories um, and 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 how we process information, kind of what I alluded, alluded to earlier with the uh, uh, neurological definition. You know, and that involves perceptions on how we store and retrieve memories, you know, and that forms our schemas or the, 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 the frameworks, um, how we process external stimuli. Um, and trauma can influence those schemas. And it can influence our beliefs about ourselves and about the world to where, you know, we may believe, okay, men are bad, men are violent, men are bad and abusive. And I deserve this for being in a relationship with a man. Um, they can disrupt our core core beliefs where we just give up, say, hey, the world is bad and I'm bad because I let this happen. Um, and then as we integrate, you know, these, these uh, um, cognitive distortions and, and integrate trauma into our belief system, um, we accommodate it to relieve the anxiety. And when that happens, there's an emergent of cognitive symptoms um, like hypervigilance, fear, and emotional de dysregulation. That's when these symptoms take hold. Um, what we have here, the theoretical foundation for trauma-informed care, this contemporary trauma theory framework. Um, these are pretty much uh, the conceptual foundation for understanding biopsychosocial impacts of trauma. Um, and a lot of these are impacts that, that victims have in common. Um, and there's a more detailed list of these and these are just a little bit of some of the symptomology behind the theory that, um, that go into a little bit more detail on the handout. Okay, now when we try to apply the trauma-informed care approach to our organization, you know, SAMHSA has laid out four key assumptions and six key principles to abide by. Um, and the key assumptions, the four R's, I mean, first is that all people at all levels of our organization, um, they have to have a basic realization about trauma and understand how trauma can affect our client systems. You know, people's experiences and behaviors are understood in the context of their coping strategies um, that they have designed to survive adversity. You know, basically, they may be maladaptive um, behaviors, but that's their survival skills. Um, Recognize. I mean, the organization needs to recognize that by applying the principles, excuse me, recognize that 
recognize the signs of trauma, you know, and this could be done through effective screening um, and assessments and through workforce development, you know, to train the employees at all levels um, in trauma-informed care. And the organization needs to respond by applying trauma-informed approach at all levels. Um, you know, staff in every part of the organization, you know, they need to be, they need to change their language and their behaviors and policies to take into consideration the experience of trauma of their client systems. And the trauma-informed approach seeks to resist re-traumatizing clients, you know, and there are some organizations that may inadvertently create a stressful or toxic environment that can uh, um, interfere with recovery for a client. Um, and those are the four R's, realization, recognition, respond, and resist re-traumatizing. Um, the six key principles, we're gonna go through these a little bit more quickly. Um, these are pretty self-explanatory, safety. You know, the organization needs to make sure that they're, their client systems and their staff, they feel physically and psychologically safe. Um, trustworthiness and transparency. The goal here is the building, is building and maintaining trust among staff and clients. Um, peer support, mutual health, health, mutual self-help um, is key for building trust and establishing safety and, uh, and empowerment for the client. Um, your collaboration, you know, that recognizes that healing happens in relationships and there's and, and, and meaning in, in sharing power and decision making. Um, the organization recognized that everyone has a role to play in trauma informed approach, everyone in the organization. So one doesn't have to be a therapist to be therapeutic. Um, and then empowerment, voice and choice, you know, organizations that aims to strengthen the staff and the client systems. And they recognize that every person's experience is unique and requires an individual approach. And then finally, you know, considering culture, historical and gender issues. And with that, you know, we need to move past cultural stereotypes and biases and offer culturally responsive services and recognize and address historical trauma. And how do we implement all of this? It starts, it starts with leadership um, and it starts with you. Yeah, I'm pointing right at you. Um, well, at all of y'all, it starts with us. You know, there's uh, um, saying it and doing it, like I said earlier, are two different things. And we can be leaders at any level, you know, and, and if you look at your handout, there's a list of questions on, on page two under leadership that you can ask yourself to consider ask your supervisors, ask the people you work with. And these are keys that draw you back into what we're going to be talking about here quickly, shortly, um, to assess. I mean, a quick assessment of are you implementing trauma-informed care or are you just talking about it and not really practicing it? Um, but it does start with leadership. And, uh, um, and that involves support and investing and implementing and sustaining the trauma-informed approach. And with policy, this approach, this practices, they need to be written into policy, into mission, into goals, into um, your SOPs. Um, we need to be cognizant of our physical environment. And that includes floor plans. That includes where we put our furniture based on where the door is. You know, you, your clients may not be comfortable with their back to the door. You may not be comfortable with your back to the door. You know, so some of those things we need to promote a sense of safety. Excuse me, um, engaging client systems, you know, this allows clients and stakeholders to have a voice and involvement, you know, in their care and in all areas of the organization. And that includes like programs, design, peer support groups, um, cross collaboration. Now, this one, I think is just real important because, you know, I'm not sure if we really consider it at times when it gets down to this level, but we need to make sure that our referrals, you know, the, the resources that we refer our clients to are implementing a trauma-informed care approach. Um, I mean, we know the resources there, they can use it, but are they going to be met with the same approach that we give our clients? And that's, to me, that's crucial to consider. Um, screening and assessing and treating, and that involves um, keeping everybody trained on the best available modalities, evidence-based modalities, 
and being culturally, excuse me, culturally appropriate and, and, and reflect trauma-informed care. Um, and make sure the screenings become part of the SOP. Workforce development, and that, again, is training for all staff at every level, um, which costs money and time. Um, and time is money, you know, and that's when we go into the financial aspect of it. Um, you know, financial structures need to be designed to support TIC um, with all these other aspects that I mentioned. And then finally, um, evaluation. I mean, measures in our evaluations and in our evaluation designs need to incorporate um, trauma-informed care, and, and it needs to be in the assessment and in the evaluation process. Um, now, a few of these things we've seen earlier when addressing uh, um, a few of these things we've seen earlier um, when in these interventions when addressing um, substance use disorder with Lacey. And what I want to get at to now is, you know, we look at these, these approaches here you know, we, we talked about eclectically um, integrating spirituality and the 12 step model into um, some of these other um, substance use disorder interventions, but like dialectic therapy and cognitive behavior therapies, you know, they're used widely in PTSD and uh, um, trauma, trauma informed correction, not trauma informed, but uh, um, trauma based disorders. Um, and this slide right here, and like I said, we're not going to get into a lot of interventions, but what I want to focus on here is these integrated models. Um, there's the addiction trauma recovery model, integrated CBT, seeking safety, and TRIM, the trauma recovery empowerment model. There's a lot, of, well, there's a lot. There's a, enough information on your handout for these integrated models, um, hopefully to get you hungry for more. And the, re the references are there so you can find more information on it. And, uh, uh, and these are great to use in conjunction with evidence-based um, interventions, you know, to treat substance use disorders in a trauma-informed manner. And lastly, barriers to implementation for trauma, um, trauma-informed care. You know, there, there's... There's been a historical separation between, you know, substance use treatment and 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 mental health systems, um, you know, and that can be evident in in visiting some of the different um, some of your different substance use disorder treatment clinics, and uh, um, you know, there's there's administrative differences, there's regulations that are different that 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 cover the two of them. Um, do you treat one and then the other? Do you treat this one, then that one? Do you treat them at the same time separately? Or, you know, the clinician's aspect, they, they need to be, that's where you might get some pushback. Managerial aspects, you might get pushback. Historical practices, you might get pushback in implementing um, trauma-informed care. Um, and the staff knowledge and skill, you know, I mean, like, we're talking about like house housekeeping and maintenance. Um, you know, the, the techs who, who, who take, you know, the, the clients from one building to another who, who supervise them during, during eating times and things like that, you know, they need to be trauma informed, informed, <laughs> um, you know, and that costs money and that that's their motivation too. They need to be, they need to want to, to practice the trauma-informed care. And again, that's resources, that's funding, that's supervision, that's um, adding that into the hiring process when you, when you hi hire anyone in your organization. Um, then of course, inadequate, inadequate screening and assessment tools that needs to become, um, to assess for trauma, that needs to become part of the approach. Um, again, and it will be if it's part of your organizational culture, but it costs money to get those sometimes to 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 find the screening tools that you want to use um also with that you know your you, you do your evaluation some of the assessment tools there might cost some money and then finally one of the big barriers is that it could be billing and regulatory restrictions to where you know 
if you're a, a, a SUDS organization and you're you're working through seeking safety or trim that I put on the other slide, you know, how do you bill that? How is it listed? What does it look like? Are you authorized through this federal, state, or what have you contract? You know, those are some of the barriers to implementing trauma-informed care. Um, this is uh, just what we talked about. And I've talked way too much. These are my references. And I need to know right now if you have any questions or comments. While well, I stop sharing my screen so I can see all of y'all's faces. There we go. Boy, I look tired. All right. I'm going to stop this recording and go deuces. Do you want to stop?